Hey everybody, how you doing? Uh, here to do something a little different today, normally giving tours of neighborhoods and things, but today we're going to have a very serious conversation with an expert on a field that is very relevant today. Uh, we're going to talk to uh, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies here at Columbia University. Uh, his name is uh, Rashid Khalidi. He recently authored the book, uh, The Hundred Years War on Palestine. Uh, very important, very good book. And we're going to talk about what's going on to kind of learn. I think it's very important to have these discussions. And the more information and the more discussions that are out there, the better. So I guess no more delay. Cam, what do you think? Should we just go up there and have a chat with the professor? Let's do it. Let's do it. Professor, if you want to do yeah. me a favor, if you could just take your hands like this and do a little clap. You ready to go? Yep. All right, so I'm here uh, with uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi. We're going we're gonna to talk about his latest book, everything that's going on in the world, a tall order, but uh, get started. How are you doing, Professor? Uh, I've been better. <laughs> sure, I guess I should have expected that. Um, but I, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your book. Um, you obviously wrote it a little bit ago, but it's an incredible book, a great primer into everything that's going on. Uh, so I figured we could just kind of start there. Mm -hmm. um, so the way you divided up your book, I thought, was very helpful. Mm -hmm. You divide it up, I guess, into six kind of time periods or mm -hmm. dates that you consider declarations of war. Um, and I think what it did a good job of is not only talking about the facts and things that are going on, but how it relates and how it affects the, the people who are there. Right. So it's not just dates and talks and this, that, and the other. Right. It's like it puts it into perspective. So I thought we could just start there, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, then let's start there. So the first one, the first chapter you have, you talk about the year 1917, I guess. Right. Quickly, I guess, uh, maybe you could talk about the significance and we can just get started there. Yeah. Um, I start with 1917 mm -hmm. because that's the year in which the British occupy Palestine and issue the Balfour Declaration. And in my understanding and my analysis and the argument I'm making, mm -hmm. that starts the series of events that lead us to the present. You know, you could start at another starting point. You could start with the beginning of Zionism. You could start any other time, um, earlier or even later. Um, you could start in 1967. But I think that the dynamic that we have seen, without exception, starts in 1917. Great power arriving mm -hmm. and endorsing this national project, the Zionist project. And that's where I think everything starts rolling. I do not think that you can understand what's happening in Palestine or the creation of Israel without understanding the enormous importance of great power involvement. Um, and that's why I start with the Balfour Declaration right. and the British occupation of Palestine. And to be, and to just to clarify, the Balfour Declaration being the British saying we endorse a national home for exactly. the Jewish people. His Majesty's government looks mm -hmm. with favor on the establishment right. of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. It being understood, blah blah blah. Right. And what they say positively about there being a Jewish people and there being entitled to a national home and Britain supporting that is not matched by anything about the Palestinians. Right. They talk about civil and religious rights right. for the existing non-Jewish non community. Right. So you don't mm -hmm. exist as a people. You are not named. Mm -hmm. The people who are named and the people who have national rights and political rights are the Jewish people. Right. So that sets the framework from then to today. And if you look at the way at which, in which Israel is regarded and the way in which the Palestinians are regarded from the establishment of Israel to mm -hmm. the present, it replicates that uneven playing field where mm -hmm. the British uh, have special regard for Zionism and absolutely no regard for the Palestinians in the Balfour Declaration and later on in the Mandate for Palestine that they administer right. uh, under the League of Nations. And this Balfour Declaration, uh, just to I guess also clarify, is is kind of the culmination a little bit in a way of of decades now of little of settlements right. and and different I guess Aliyah or Aliyot they were talking about right. different groups and right. waves of settlement. Uh, that it started in the late 1800s, I guess, to pick up steam. Exactly. And Zionism being kind of the, the nationalist drive to establish a home. Right. Um, so so the, the British kind of get involved. And I think what was interesting also in the book is that you talk about how it was kind of a, 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 a political endorsement more mm -hmm. than a religious endorsement right. because, right. in fact, Balfour himself, right, was in the past had, had kind of endorsed the opposite side. He was, yeah. you know, um, so I thought when, that was very interesting. When Balfour was prime minister. When he was, yeah. The British Parliament, under his leadership, passed one of the most anti-Semitic acts in British history, uh, the Alien Exclusion Act, right. to keep Jewish refugees fleeing pogroms in Russia right. from entering Britain. So, right. uh, you know, philo-Semitism or love of Jews or anything like that was not really the driving factor. Right. Uh, it was strategic. The British wanted to control Palestine, and they saw the Zionist project as what could become what a British official later called a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of hostile Arabs. 
So that's what they were after. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I guess also too to add on to that, those same pogroms are what pushed a lot of the early exactly. settlements into what what became exactly. Israel, and also what what pushed a lot of the settlement to New York. Even a lot well, of the Jewish immigration came here because of much larger numbers of people right. who left the persecution of Tsarist Russia ended up here mm -hmm. or in other countries of immigration like right. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. than ever went to Palestine. Uh, the ones who went to Palestine were people who believed in Zionism, which is an, a national project saying that the Jews are a modern people deserving a modern nation state. Um, and it was a movement started, you know, political movement started in 1897. Theodore Herzl was mm -hmm. the founder. Um, and had been searching for an external patron because they understood that to colonize Palestine, they used that term. They it's not my right. term, right. it's their term. To colonize Palestine and to establish a Jewish state there, they needed a great power patron. So Herzl went around Europe, went to the Germans, uh, Kaiser, went to the French, and so on. His successor, Chaim Weizmann, uh, uh, hit pay dirt with the British mm -hmm. during World War One, and that's part of the genesis of this of this Balfour Declaration. Right, and I think it's interesting. So I'm just going to keep adding on to the things you say because they're so interesting. But when you bring up the the word and the, the term colonization, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting how you say that's the term they use because. This is coming from a time, 1800s, when that isn't the dirty word it is today. Exactly. Um, which I think is an important point as we continue the conversation. Attitudes have changed towards exactly. this idea. In fact, right up to World War II. Right up to World War II. Sure. You know, the colonial powers yeah. dominated the world yeah. and were proud of being colonial powers. Right. Settler colonialism was a good thing, mm -hmm. doing what we did to Native Americans mm -hmm. or doing what the British did to native populations in New Zealand yeah. or Canada or Australia was a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so the Zionist project, which is on a, a national project, right. uh, also saw itself as a settler colonial project mm -hmm. with a right to Palestine, whether biblical or otherwise. But uh, it understood that the process it was undertaking involved doing to the native population what settler colonial projects do. Right. And there's a ton of documentation of how Herzl and Weizmann and Ben Gurion and, all the, and Jabotinsky, all the earlier lead, earliest leaders, of the Zionist movement saw things in that way. After World War II, things changed. Right. Uh, the Zionists uh, came into conflict with the British, and they started to portray themselves as anti-colonial. But the settler colonial process was embedded in how they uh, approached Palestine and dealt with it. Uh, and they weren't embarrassed uh, about using mm -hmm. those terms. So you had something called the Jewish Colonization Agency. That's their name for it. Right. That's not my name for it. Uh, and that existed up until, 19, uh, I think, 58. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, something changes, of course, mm -hmm. after World War II. But the nature of the process, you can look at it today in the West Bank. If this isn't settler colonialism, I don't know what it is. Right. And it's interesting you bring that up because I guess we're going to go to that part, part uh, here in a second. But post World War II, around the time that Israel is being established, independence, all that, is around, is the opposite is happening in the rest of the world. Right. Other places are actually shaking off exactly. colonization in Africa and all these, in the Middle East, all these different things. You've got all these independence movements breaking away from colonization at the same time a colonization project is being started, right? Or continuing at the very least. Uh, or yeah. successful. Or I mean, successful, it's established right. as a nation sure. state. So decolonization is right. taking place in many parts of the world after yeah. World War II. And in Palestine, that process is, you know, successful. Right, right. Which brings, I guess, to the next part. Uh, and sorry if I'm talking too fast. Let me know if I need to slow down. I drank a lot of coffee today, so. Okay. <laughs> so the next, that brings us to the next part, which is 1947. You mm -hmm. have the next, the next, which is 1947. You got post-World War II and I guess the UN partition plan here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously in 1948, you have independence. I guess maybe you could talk a little bit about this period as well. Right. Um, one of the problems with the way in which what happens in 1947-48 is it's looked at in isolation. Um, people don't see, for example, the impact of the Palestinians on the Palestinians mm -hmm. of their failed revolt of the late 1930s, when the British bring in 100,000 troops, kill, wound, imprison, and exile maybe 16, 17 percent of the adult male population, confiscate all the weapons, destroy the Palestinian national movement, build up the armed forces of the Zionist movement, train them, arm them, expand them, and so on. Uh, they don't also think about the shift that takes place in World War II, where the British Empire really is, is uh, on the ropes. Mm -hmm. And you have two new superpowers emerge with the, with the uh, German uh, attack, the Nazi attack on Russia, and with the Japanese attack on the United States. Suddenly, Britain and France and the old colonial powers are dwarfed mm -hmm. by these two new giants. These are the superpowers. Uh, and that's enormously important for what 
follows for 47, 48. Mm -hmm. Finally, there's the Holocaust. Um, everything in Palestine is affected one way or another by these events in Europe, these events like the pogroms of uh, the 1880s and 1890s or 1904, 1905 in Russia, or um, the rise to power of Hitler in the 1930s. Emigration from Russia and emigration from Germany is driven by European anti-Semitism. Uh, there's a nationalist project there, but many people are just fleeing for their lives mm -hmm. or because the persecution is in, intolerable. And you have then the Holocaust, this mm -hmm. massacre of six million people, mm -hmm. uh, six million Jews and millions and millions of others. Um, and that in turn has an enormous effect. It has an effect in particular on the Western powers uh, who are the victors of World War II, all of whom are guilty of not doing enough to and stop the Holocaust. borders and all those kind of things. In yeah. particular because of, the, because of the racist immigration yeah. laws that we had in this country mm -hmm. and that the British had and that other countries had, such that people who could have been saved before mm -hmm. World War II uh, could not get out. Right. There was no place to go. I mean, I was talking to a friend the other day who described to me how her parents had to scramble to get visas to get out of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and finally managed. And so she was born in the United States, but other members of the family died in the Holocaust because they couldn't get a, a, a place of refuge mm -hmm. uh, after, uh, after the Nazis took over Czechoslovakia, 38, 39. And so there's a sense of, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of guilt, mm -hmm. and they had good reason to be, feel guilty. And that in turn spurred the, the, the support that the Zionist project got uh, in the United Nations in 1947. So the partition plan, that's adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in November of 1947 mm -hmm. is adopted because you have these two new superpowers, both of which push for it, the Soviet Union and the United States, because you have this deep sense of guilt on the part of Western countries, and also because you have strategic motives. So both the Soviets and the Americans thought that they could gain advantage by, from the establishment of Israel, strategic advantage. Just like the British back in 1917, mm -hmm. the essential motivation is not some deep compassion mm -hmm. on the part of statesmen in Washington or uh, politicians in, in, in Moscow. It's a calculation of advantage for their country uh, in, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so this partition plan is proposed 47, and I, a, a common thing you'll hear a lot is, okay, well, uh, Israelis accept the partition plan, mm -hmm. and the Palestinians reject it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is an important point because a lot of it is kind of nitpick. People nitpick the right. boundaries and all this and the other one. In reality, it's the principle of right. the issue. I mean, it's the principle of you're going to come in here and tell us what is ours and what's not. Exactly. I mean, yeah. from a Palestinian perspective, mm -hmm. under the covenant of the League of Nations, which supposedly governed the mandate system, which is in force up until 1948. And which was in place starting early 1920s. Right? Starting early yep. 1922, 1922, the mandate sure. for Palestine mm -hmm. is adopted. Um, Palestine and other Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire are supposed to be independent countries. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians say, how are you establishing this Jewish national home in what is supposed to be our independent country? You have promised us self-determination and we never got it. The Charter of the United Nations takes us a step further and says all colonized peoples have a right to self-determination. The Palestinians say, we're two-thirds we're two of the population. We're the overwhelming majority. We are the indigenous population. On what basis do you take more than half of our country and give it to this minority? which owns less than 8% of the land. So most of Palestine, including most of the fertile land, over 55%, is given by the United Nations or, or, or uh, is, is uh, uh, established by the United Nations uh, as a Jewish state. And the remaining 40 some odd percent is to be an Arab state. Uh, and the Palestinians refuse this. They say, it's mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. You're giving us less than half of it? We're two thirds of the population? The charter says we're entitled to self-determination. On what basis do you violate those charter provisions? Well, because the United States and the Soviet Union had the votes in the General Assembly and bullied and bribed countries uh, to go along. Uh, and so the General Assembly passes this resolution. It abs does absolutely nothing to enforce the resolution, to ensure that an Arab state comes into being. And from 1947 onwards, what you can call a civil war develops between the two communities in Palestine. The overwhelming Palestinian majority, which had been crushed by the British mm -hmm. a, few years, a few years earlier, and the Jewish minority led by the Zionist movement, which had been armed and trained and reinforced by the British and had the support of the two great superpowers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the result is an overwhelming victory long before Israel is established in May 1948, long before Arab armies enter for the militias 
of the Zionist movement. They overrun Arab cities, overrun Arab villages, expel their population, such that by the time Israel is established on May 15, 1948, over 300,000 Palestinians have been made refugees. The cities of Jaffa, Haifa, Bissan, Tiberias, Safad have been overrun and emptied of their Arab yeah. population. So before the 1948 war between the Arab countries and Israel begins, Israel has already overrun territories that were supposed to go to the Arab state, mm -hmm. and the United Nations does absolutely nothing. It's perfectly clear that what the superpowers intended was the creation of a Jewish state. Mm -hmm. They had no particular interest and absolutely no skin in the game as far as an Arab state was concerned. Nobody lifted a finger. The Arab armies enter, and the rest of it we know. Israel eventually, it's a, it's a close uh, fight. Uh, Israel suffers uh, 6,000 people killed. The Arab armies suffer many more, and the Arabs are eventually defeated, and there's an armistice. there are armistice agreements in 1949. In the meantime, Israel is established on May 15th, 1948. Mm -hmm. And those, and those uh, 300,000 you were saying that who were expelled before the uh, independence 1948 added on to the 400,000 that exactly. were expelled during exactly. the actual war, creating, I think, like 720-ish thousand people. We don't know the exact number. Right. 700, 750 in that range. Right. And that's what was considered. Some people have said more. That's not the point. Right. It's not the point. I the think. overwhelming majority yes. of the Arab population of what becomes Israel are driven out right. or forced to flee or flee in terror. And this is the and this is a phrase and this is a term that everyone hears of, called the Nakba, which is the right. catastrophe and and where everyone is driven out, right. uh, and leaving behind I guess uh, a, a few hundred thousand still within the new uh, new state of Israel. Exactly. Uh, and that we'll get to that in a second. But that's I guess forty seven forty eight, and then it brings us to the next I guess chapter. Uh, so starting in forty eight all the way to 1967, you have basically a military uh, occupation uh, of the Palestinian people within Israel. They're, they're, they're under, under military, military rule, rule until 1966. And then that brings us to 1967, which is the next uh, section of your book. Right. I guess we, talk, we could talk here about what, what happened in 1967. I mean, I, I, I framed these chapters, yes. the, the ones that we've already mm -hmm. talked about, and the one that we're about to talk about, the 67 chapter, as declarations, declarations of, war of war on the right. Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm arguing is that this is not just a struggle between two peoples. I mean, there are now two peoples. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. It's a struggle, first of all, in which there's a big, fat imperialist thumb mm -hmm. on the scales in favor first of the Zionist movement and later the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's external powers yeah. that have supported first the Zionist project and then the state of Israel. And secondly, um, you have this process of settler colonialism ongoing. Mm -hmm. And it's not a fair fight, actually. It's a fight between this, this national movement supported by outside powers and the Palestinians who really are outgunned and outmanned. They're not outmanned, they're more numerous, but they're outgunned. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't have very strong support. And this is an attack on them, is how I see the whole process mm -hmm. from 1917 onwards. Sometimes the actual fighting is done by the British, as in 1936 to mm -hmm. 1939, when they crush this revolt. They bring in 100,000 troops, the Royal Air Force, and so on and so forth. Mostly. After that, the fighting is done by the Israeli army mm -hmm. um, with this support by external powers. And the thing that I try and focus on in the 67 chapter is not the well-known details of what happens during the war or right. the occupation of Sinai and the Golan and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and Jerusalem, but rather the role of the United States. So this is an Israeli war. It's an Israeli preemptive strike on the Arab countries that have massed their armies. But it is a, a war launched by Israel after getting a green light from Washington. And from this point on, the United States has already become one of the main armors of Israel. Israel fights the 67 war mainly with British and French weapons, but it's already beginning to get U.S. weapons. But from 67 on, the United States has I mean, the, big, the metaphor of the big fat thumb on the scales. Right. The United States is supplying the weaponry with which Israel maintains absolute military superiority over all of its enemies combined. And it also is providing the diplomatic cover so the United States, after the 67 war, um, engineers the uh, adoption by the UN Security Council of a resolution called 242. Yeah. And that basically gives the Israelis what they want. It, it doesn't force them to withdraw from the territories mm -hmm. they occupied until they get what, what they want, which is recognition of their state by the Arab countries, peace treaties, and an elimination of the Palestinian refugee question. The, the problems created in 40. 48, 49, by the occupation of most of the Arab state, by the expulsion of all these Palestinians, these are swept under the rug by 242. Mm -hmm. And that's what Israel wanted. So the United States is running diplomatic interference for Israel from 67 onwards 
just as it has been doing in the Security Council in the last several months, uh, preventing the adoption of any resolution that did anything that Israel didn't want. Mm -hmm. That's not a new phenomenon. Right. Uh, that's been going on for 50 odd years. And it's that section, I'm sorry, the, the resolution 242 has been the basis exactly. of all uh, negotiations, everything ever since. Ever since. And it's interesting you bring up, we forgot to mention, I forgot to mention at the beginning, was um, you brought up the, the, also the right of return this mm -hmm. idea of uh, the right of return, which I think is very important, and right. it's something that you know for Palestinians has been categorically rejected uh, from the beginning by as, Israel. By Israel, exactly. As opposed to, let's say, the ability of, of Jews from all over the country to then move all over Israel, the world, all over the world. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Uh, to be able to return to Israel, right. I think right. maybe you could maybe you could speak on that real quick right. just before we move on. Back in 1948, mm -hmm. uh, the General Assembly, um, after passing the resolution that you know the Partition Resolution. Mm -hmm in 1947, uh, in the wake of the expulsion of these hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, passes uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 194, which calls for the right of return of these of Palestinian refugees, mm -hmm. the right of return and compensation. This is, this is one of the many things that swept under the rug by 242. It talks about a just resolution of the, Palestine, of the refugee problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say how and why. It doesn't talk about return or, or restitution or compensation. It simply says a just solution. That can mean anything. And they don't even mention Palestinians, as in so many of these international documents which determine the fate of Palestine and the Palestinian people. Palestinians are not consulted or mentioned. Nobody asked them about the mandate. Nobody asked them about the Balfour Declaration. Nobody asked them about 242. They don't mm -hmm. exist. They're not at the table. And that's the situation today. And that's been the situation for the Palestinians pretty much since the beginning. There are exceptions. Um, the Oslo negotiations, mm -hmm. the Madrid Peace Conference, and we'll so on. To, we'll get to those, too. I know. And it's interesting with the 242, just, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that they weren't in the, at the table negotiating the language and things because the language is what's pointed to a lot of the times to exactly. justify. So, exactly. for example, the territories question. So I exactly. think in the, the language is withdrawal from territories as opposed to all the territories. Exactly. So they can point and say, it just says from territory, so they can withdraw from a few but leave the rest. That was Ambassador Goldberg. Lord Carradine, mm -hmm. um, uh, our, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, mm -hmm. the British permanent representative, Lord Carradine, and Abba Ibn, the Israeli foreign minister, are the key, who's in New York. Uh, I mean, um, my father worked for the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, Secretariat, and his job was in what was then called the United, uh, uh, Political Security Council, uh, PSP, whatever, a Political and Security Council Affairs mm -hmm. Division of the Secretariat. So his job was to sit in the Security Council behind the undersecretary, and provide the materials necessary for them. So I, I knew all, I was following this stuff. I was in the council chamber mm -hmm. uh, throughout the June War, for example, as a, in the visitor's gallery, uh, watching this happen. Uh, and I talk about this in the book, actually, a little bit. Um, and this is a resolution drafted by the United States, Britain, and Israel right. to serve Israeli interests, essentially. Uh, later on in November, I was there in June. By November, then they drafted it. The same process was going mm -hmm. on. Okay. Well, I guess we can keep moving then. I, so mm -hmm. we just covered 1967. Uh, what, uh, so the next, the next period being, the next year being, the next chapter being 1982. Right, right. Let's go, let's get into it. I mean, one of the things about this book, um, you, you, you mentioned that I, I divided into yes. six chapters. Mm -hmm. One of the things I tried to do with this book, as you said, was to show how these historical yes. events affected people. And I figured the best way to do that was to describe it through the experience of people, of myself, and for earlier people, uh, for earlier periods, people I knew. Mm -hmm. So I use my uncle's memoirs. I use uh, what was told to me by my aunts, my uncles, my parents. I use the memoir of my wife's uh, 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 grandfather, things like that. Mm -hmm. I use memoirs of people I knew. Uh, and I use conversations I had with people, and then my own personal experiences to show how this affected people. And uh, in the 67 chapter that we just talked about, mm -hmm. um, I start with my own experience at the UN in the visitor's gallery of the Security Council. In the 82 chapter, and watching uh, a ceasefire resolution not be passed. Mm -hmm. Why are they not passing a ceasefire resolution? Well, my father later explains it to me, and that's, that's the beginning of that chapter. In the 82 chapter, uh, we were in Beirut, uh, my wife and I. We were both, uh, uh, I was teaching at the American University of Beirut, I was doing research, and I was also involved in Palestinian politics. And my wife was the editor of the Palestine news agency English Language Bulletin and was in the area being bombed mm -hmm. on the first day of the 1982 war when Israel invaded Lebanon and eventually besieged Beirut and drove the PLO out and then, uh, 
engineered massacres in Palestinian refugee camps uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I describe in that, at the beginning of that chapter, my own personal experiences. You know, the bombing beginning, my wife is stuck in this neighborhood being bombed, mm -hmm. I have two kids in school, one in a school in one place, another in a school in another place, my wife is pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, I just describe that whole, per I describe it from a personal perspective, how we found out about the Sabra and Chetia, the massacres, uh, at the end of the war. Right, and so this, and this all is, I guess, around, these, these events are happening around the bombing of Lebanon, pursuing the PLO who exactly. was at the time in Lebanon with the intent of getting rid of the PLO exactly. and driving them out of Lebanon. But in the process, you know, civilians die, part, neighbor, almost, entire neighborhoods destroyed. Almost 20,000 right. Palestinians and Lebanese are killed in the course of this Israeli invasion. Um, and what I talk about in the book is that this is not just an Israeli invasion. Right. Before the then defense minister, Ariel Sharon, launches this war, uh, uh, he, set, he goes to Washington mm -hmm. and he talks to the Secretary of State, General Haig, and gets an American green light for driving the PLO out of Lebanon, for driving the Syrians out of Lebanon, and for creating a Lebanese government that will do what Israel wants, sign a peace treaty with Israel. Um, and this is seen as an American objective for Cold War reasons. It has to do right. with, with you know, sympathy for Israel and sympathy for Israel's v version of its conflict with the Palestinians, but it's mainly seen as these are Soviet proxies, and you know, mm -hmm. Haig and, and President Reagan were people who saw everything in Cold War black and white terms. Yeah. Um, so uh, Sharon basically sells them a bill of goods. Um, and that is, that's the basis for the war. It's not, not just an Israeli war. It's an Israeli-American war. Right. It's a war fought with the endorsement of the United States, with weapons supplied by the United States, and with American diplomatic support, which prevents the war being ended on anything but Israel's terms. Right. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what's happened dozens of times right. Right. since 1967. Yeah. So I think if you do not bring in that international dimension, whether in 82 or 67 or the war in Gaza, uh, you're seeing things from a perspective which is false, yeah. essentially. It's leaving out everything. It leaves out everything, yeah. really. Not everything. It leaves out so many a important lot, yeah. factors that you understand nothing. Right. And I think it's an important point that you bring up the Cold War because, I mean, I don't think people understand how important the Cold War was to any decision made on exactly. foreign policy in that entire period, all the way exactly. to the early 90s. And that, that really colored everything. Um, from, really, from World War II on. Right. I mean, it's one of the reasons the United States and the Soviet Union support the Partition Resolution, 1947. They each think they'll get Cold War advantage by doing it. They're on the same side, mm -hmm. strangely. Right. But they're doing it for Cold War reasons. Right. Same thing happens in 56, when they're on the same side opposing Israel, Britain, and France mm -hmm. when they invade Egypt, again, for Cold War reasons. Right. And that holds, as you say, right up to the early 90s, when the Cold War briefly ends. We're right. back. We're back in a Cold War. But yeah. anyway, I mean, a hot war in Ukraine, actually. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, I, guess, I guess just to piggyback on that, so the PLO is driven out of Lebanon mm -hmm. uh, in the process. And this is, I think, an interesting point that you bring up. Uh, I've heard you bring up in other interviews. The PLO is driven out of Lebanon, and what, you, what you, Lebanon has no more PLO, but Hezbollah exactly. rises right after. So, and I heard you bring this up in an interview with regards to what's happening today, where even Secretary, Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin bringing up this idea that uh, you know you can by by killing civilians and all this, you may win a, a battle as opposed, to, but strategically in the long term, that's not going to help the actual you know. Well, on, on the contrary, I mean Israel yeah, right. suffered enormously. Right from the blowback right. uh, of the Lebanon invasion of 1982. Right. Um, it drove the PLO leadership and, and its military forces out of Lebanon, but it, by killing 20,000 people. Right. I mean, people say, the end of the war was the, 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 the departure of the PLO. It was the death of 20,000 people, right. the maiming of tens of thousands of others, and the creation among Lebanese of deep, enduring resentments. Mm -hmm. That produced Hezbollah. It wasn't the Palestinians who produced it. It wasn't the Soviets. It wasn't you know, the Syrians or the Iranians. It was the grievances created by the way in which Israel operated in Lebanon from the moment they crossed the border and had been operating actually before that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you get this force that people talk about as if it's some golem or some you know, robot or monster. Well, this is a, produ a product of Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. In fact, Ehud Barak, later on defense minister of Israel, later on prime minister of Israel, said there was no Hezbollah before we came. We created it. It was a result of our occupation. Mm -hmm. um, he has the habit sometimes of saying things that are true. <laughs> As are other Israeli yeah. prime ministers. Yeah. Another one, Ehud Olmert, has been saying entirely, quite 
perceptive things about this war on Gaza. So has Barack. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't so perceptive when they were prime ministers. Well, I guess that brings us to the next, I guess the next period, which would be, you have 1987 to 1980, I'm sorry, 1995. Um, so I guess, yeah, a lot, lot happened there. Right. I guess maybe we could, now you could start off and right. what, what you think would uh, be worth mentioning. Well, I mean, it's, this is a little harder to fit into the, sure. into yeah. the, into the um, framework that I used, which mm -hmm. is a war, a war on Palestine. But what I'm describing here is the so-called peace process. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I was intimately acquainted with because I was a, an advisor to the Palestinian delegation in the Madrid peace talks of 1991, and I continued uh, in the negotiations that went on for nine different additional sessions in Washington up to the summer of 1993. Um, and I was in touch with people who've been involved thereafter, and so I, was, I knew exactly what was going on. And what I try and argue in this chapter is that the so-called Oslo peace process was in fact not a process designed to bring peace between Palestinians and Israelis. Um, what President Bush, George H.W., and Secretary Baker envisaged in Madrid was to bring about a comprehensive peace settlement between Israel and the Arab countries. And in fact, they achieved a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, and they were very close, at least twice, to a peace treaty with Syria and Lebanon. Um, you can read the accounts in particular of the, Syrian, of the Israeli negotiator, Itamar Rabinovich, um, who makes it very clear that they were this close. And every account says that. So to, to their credit, um, the US government were really trying to achieve peace between the, the Arab countries and Israel. And as I say, they achieved one treaty or helped to achieve one treaty. And another was very, very close. Failed, but it was very. With the Palestinians, however, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. We were not allowed in our negotiations to deal with a final resolution of this conflict, nor a peace treaty nor the establishment of a Palestinian state, nor borders, nor ending the occupation, nor stopping Israeli colonization of the occupied territories, nor the issue of Jerusalem, nor the issue of refugees, nor the issue of water. In other words, all the important issues mm -hmm. were off the table. All we were allowed to talk about were interim self-government arrangements under a continuing Israeli military occupation and in a circumstance in which Israeli occupation, uh, sorry, uh, colonization and settlement and appropriation of land and expansion of their footprint would continue. And when we brought up in the negotiations, how can you ask us to negotiate over a, a, a pie which the Israelis are eating while we negotiate? Mm -hmm. The Americans said nothing. Even though in their original documents and the original guarantees and, 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 and uh, the, the framework for the negotiations, supposedly the, the status quo was supposed to be maintained, but the United States wasn't willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Essentially, this was designed to f prevent Israel from having to make the hard decisions about ending its occupation, about stopping the, the colonization of the occupied territories, and about recognizing an independent Palestinian state. Those things were never part of the negotiations. Mm -hmm. No, those will be dealt with in final status negotiations. Right. Well, they still haven't been dealt with. And we're talking about negotiations that started in 1991. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I think within that context, too, you have things like, for example, 1993. A lot of people think, oh, Oslo, they think, like, said 1993, the Declaration of Principle, Principles, the, the shaking hands on the White House lawn, everyone's like, well, why hasn't this solved everything? You know, Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin, they shake hands, and everyone's like, well, there it is, peace. They, I think they both won Nobel Prizes. Exactly. Like, everything's, everything's figured out. But that's really just one tiny little part exactly. of that. And even exactly. then, Yasser Arafat kind of did that on his own, right? And uh, around Well, he had support yes. from the Palestinians. Right. Uh, over, overwhelming majority of Palestinians mm -hmm. because they believed it would lead to a Palestinian state, an end to occupation, road. and an end to settlement. Right. But if you look at what they agreed on right. in Oslo, and that was sealed on the White House lawn, the Palestinians, the PLO, recognized Israel. The state of Israel was recognized by mm -hmm. the PLO. The PLO previously had renounced violence. So on the one hand, you give up your, your, your resort to violence, mm -hmm. and you give up your, your uh, reluctance to recognize Israel. Israel didn't recognize the right of the Palestinians to a state. It never did that. It said, we recognize that, that the, the, the PLO represents the Palestinian people, and we'll negotiate right. with it. What are you negotiating for? Well, as Rabin said in his last speech uh, before the Knesset, before he was murdered, because mm -hmm. in the eyes of the right wing, he'd gone too far, and they killed him. Mm -hmm. um, as he said in his last speech, 
uh, what we're offering the Palestinians is less than a state. And we intend to maintain security control over the Jordan River Valley. Therefore, over the envelope within which this so-called less than a state would operate. So Israel, to this day, has never recognized a fully independent sovereign, the, the right of the Palestinians to a fully independent sovereign state. Even other prime ministers like Barak and Ehud Olmert, who later on did negotiate, never went beyond what Rabin said. We will mm -hmm. keep security control, and this will ultimately be less than state. So it's not really a sovereign state. It's like a, a glorified Bantustan. Mm -hmm. And that's the unequal, uh, the unequal nature of the Oslo Accords. Israel is recognized by the Palestinians who give up violence. I Israel doesn't renounce violence. Mm -hmm. Israel doesn't end its occupation. Israel doesn't recognize the Palestinians have a right to self-determination and statehood. And Israel doesn't stop eating up the, the disputed territory, mm -hmm. the occupied territory of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. It continues to settle and, and, and deprive the Palestinians of space for a putative Palestinian state. And you, and you brought it up, you brought up the Bantu stands and this idea of carving up the area. Right. I want to get back to that, but before we do, uh, I, I want to just, just to wrap it up, the, the chapter begins in 1987, which has some right. significance because it's the first intifada, right. which is basically, uh, you know, obviously the Palestinians kind of coming together and kind of basically just kind of saying, you know, this is enough, and right. it becomes a protest movement. Uh, in contrast to the second intifada, which we'll get to, it's more, it's more uh, I don't want to say completely peaceful, but more peaceful than the right. original one. And that's kind of this beginning of the, the tide being turned towards people realizing that the Palestinians right. have a claim publicly and right. internationally towards, uh, you know, uh, personhood, nationhood, all those types of things, correct? Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, the first intifada is really important mm -hmm. in a number of ways. I mean, I talk about it as one of the first real successes mm -hmm. of the Palestinian national movement. Because as you said, I think it establishes Palestinian personhood in the eyes of much of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, it was largely nonviolent. It wasn't nonviolent, but it was largely non it was mass-based. It involved strikes and demonstrations and boycotts and all kinds of quite innovative, grassroots means of protesting against a military occupation that had gone on for 20 years. I think it's really important. Intifada means uprising. Uprising against what? Uprising against military occupation. That's what it means. Uh, it, the term has been distorted. Uh, by people, ill-intentioned, um, um, poorly informed people, into some kind of uh, claim that, oh, this is, this is a call for genocide. It's not quite so. Intifada means rising up, rising up against what is now 56 years of military occupation. Three generations have grown up under the boot heel of Israeli soldiers with no justice, no rights. <laughs> All decisions that are important are made by Israeli military and uh, the Israeli military and the Israeli government. Mm -hmm. And that's what people have risen up against. That's what resistance is against. Um, and that is, that's just, it's vital to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, you, any military occupation generates resistance, generates a, a, a desire to, to, to throw off uh, that, the chains uh, that military occupation entails. Um, and that was also the case with the Second Intifada, mm -hmm. which was much more violent. Right, and the Second Intifada is a, comes as a result of those failed Oslo uh, negotiations and, and what resulted from that. And I wanted to just touch on that real quick. You, you mentioned the Bantu stands, part of the Oslo negotiations with Oslo II. Uh, th th they carved up basically the occupied territories exactly. and, and to A, B, and C. Exactly. Israel having control over C, uh, the, the Palestinians having contr limited so, control over A, and then they joint control over B. Is exactly. Correct? Yeah, so it's exactly. basically literally carved up into what would be kind of Bantu stands as a reference to South Africa. And, and then each of those areas is further carved up. Right. Um, and this is where you get the Second Intifada, right. because people are very happy when in 1988 the people PLO adopts a program of recognition of Israel, recognition of the, of the principle of partition, uh, renunciation of violence, and is, its willingness to enter into negotiations. The negotiations then start in 1991 in, in Madrid, and they're continued throughout the decade of the 90s. Mm -hmm. They're deliriously happy when Arafat signs this thing in 1993. Now, there are many people who oppose. They said we should never have renounced violence, we should never have recognized Israel, we should never have, have abandoned our claim to the entirety of Palestine, and these people end up in Hamas and other rejectionist groups. But the overwhelming majority is supportive at this point, 19, early 1990s, 1993. They support the PLO, they support what Arafat has done. But then over the next seven years, as the Oslo Accords are implemented, 
and further negotiated. They realize not only what you've said, which is far from getting an end to occupation and an end to settlement, occupation is further entrenched and we are locked into these small areas with Israeli checkpoints and walls and, and so on and so forth. And gates and gates yeah. and all of that stuff. But uh, we are much more restricted and actually much poorer at the end of this, by the end of the 90s, than we were in the early 90s or before the first intifada. Palestinian GDP per capita goes down. Palestinian movement is restricted and further restricted and further restricted. Mm -hmm. You can't go from the West Bank to Gaza anymore. You can't go to, into Israel anymore. You can't go into Jerusalem anymore. And Palestinians realize our situation is considerably worse as a result of Oslo than it was under direct occupation. And we have supposedly have a Palestinian authority, mm -hmm. which has no sovereignty, which has no jurisdiction, and which has very little authority. In fact, Israel is the ultimate authority under a much tighter regime of control mm -hmm. than had been the case before the first intifada. So public opinion has soured. And that's what, one of the many reasons that the second intifada is so violent. And people, people essentially all over the, I, I was living in Jerusalem for part of these years, uh, on and off, from the early 90s uh, on, uh, into the mid 90s. And I could see these things changing before my eyes. I try and describe them in this chapter. Mm -hmm. To understand what happens in the 2000s, you have to see how Palestinians feel that they've been completely snookered. Far from getting a situ an improved situation, they got a much worse situation. And that's where you get the Second Intifada. The Second Intifada leads to an Israeli crackdown, um, which is devastating. Many Israelis are killed by Palestinian violence. Many more Palestinians are killed by Israeli violence. The ratio is like three or four to one right. uh, uh, of casualties. Um, it's one of the largest civilian death tolls in Israeli history, and it's one of the largest Palestinian death tolls in Palestinian history. Um, the, the period of the Second Intifada. It, 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 it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. It's nothing compared to what we're seeing now in right. Gaza. Not nothing, but it's not, not on, on the scale of what we're seeing in Gaza. But um, it changes everything. And you, you start with, the, I guess, the Second Intifada beginning in 2000, you go all the way to 2014, because right. then there are, are multiple operations by the IDF and everything to kind of crack down with all these, you know, like kind of ominous names and everything right. into them. And, and those mainly happen, directed at Gaza. Right, mainly directed at Gaza. And those all happen in that same time period, correct? And then it ends right. in 2014 right. in, in your book. Um, okay, well, th that covers the chapters that you had in your book. I, I just kind of wanted to, to touch on some of the, uh, I, guess, I guess, ideas and everything that you kind of bring up. Um, one, I guess, uh, being that uh, there, there's this common, I guess, thread you hear, uh, the counter being that the Israelis, I'm sorry, the, the Palestinians reject, it's the, the, the term is rejectionism, right. that they reject everything that, that is kind of uh, offered by Israel. Right. Um, I think from, from reading your book, it seems that uh, a lot of it has to do with what's being offered, right. which is never really talked about. The U.S. and Israel mm -hmm. comes to the table with an offer and it's rejected. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. Sure. On this. I mean, this goes back to the 30s. Mm -hmm. and I could talk about the 1930s or the 1940s. I've explained why Palestinians rejected the partition plan. Mm -hmm. There were a few who wanted to accept it. King Abdullah wanted the Palestinians to accept it mm -hmm. because he figured he'd get a big chunk of Palestine. There would never be a Palestinian state. Uh, there would be a Jordanian occupation, which in fact there was, of a chunk of the area that was supposed to be part of the Palestinian state. Um, so I've, I've given some of the reasons mm -hmm. for Palestinian rejection in the, in the previous period. Mm -hmm. um, Palestinians were never offered anything until Oslo. So it's not like they had anything to reject. They didn't exist. They were not recognized by the United States until they jumped through a bunch of hoops. Um, and those hoops, I think one can talk about. The United States said, Palestinians have to renounce violence, recognize Israel, and accept to, uh, Security Council Resolution 242. Well, Security Council Resolution 242 negates Palestinian rights. It negates the right of return. It negates the right of statehood that the 47 partition plan established. Um, it negates a variety of other, and it doesn't even mention the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to accept a resolution drafted uh, to, to fit Israeli desiderata and, and extremely unfavorable to us. Uh, and to recognize Israel without Israel reciprocally recognizing the Palestinian right of self-determination. Mm -hmm. So what were they rejecting? They were rejecting an extremely unfavorable right. proposal. Uh, when they went ahead and accepted 242 in 1998, uh, 1988, sorry, when they went ahead and renounced violence, when they went ahead and recognized Israel, when they went ahead and accepted the principle of mm -hmm. partition, they still didn't get mm -hmm. an Israeli recognition or an American recognition 
of the right to an end of, to occupation, an end to settlement and colonization, and acceptance of Palestinian self-determination, statehood and sovereignty. That's still not on the table. Right. I mean, if you look at what Israel and the United States talk about now, I mean, let's leave aside Israel. If you look at what the United States talk about, talks about now, up to the present, they're not talking about full sovereignty. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard an American statesperson say, end to occupation, end to settlement, withdraw the three quarters of a million settlers who have uh, 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 colonized mm -hmm. the occupied territories. That, that's not there. That language is never used. Well, you don't have an end to the, the parcelization and bantusization of the mm -hmm. occupied territories. You don't have statehood. You're talking about something much less than sovereignty, much less than self-determination. So the Palestinians are rejecting something that's extraordinarily unfavorable mm -hmm. to them and is drafted by the Israelis and their American friends to give Israel everything it wants. And on that point, it's interesting because the common, the common response would be it's for security reasons. Yeah. Uh, you think of like the famous Golda Meir uh, quote where it's like if the Arabs put down their, their weapons, we, we won't have violence. If the Israelis right. put down their weapons, we won't have Israel. Uh, I, I think that's a common thing, and, and I was wondering if you could speak on that idea. I mean, if Golda was good at anything, she was good at PR. She was brilliant. I mean, yeah. I, I heard, once heard her yeah. speak when I was a, an undergraduate. Um, she was quite... Too, but too, she also mentioned the fact that, that Palestinians don't exist. That yeah, of course. Well, but made, that's the whole point. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the whole point. There is no acceptance by Israel of Palestinian, of, 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 of Palestinian peoplehood mm -hmm. as equal to Israeli peoplehood. In fact, Israeli law, laws with constitutional force, say quite the opposite. Only the Jewish people have the right of self-determination in Israel or in the land of Israel. Well, when you say that, you're saying there is no Palestinian people, or at least they don't have the rights of self, the right of self-determination mm -hmm. that a people would enjoy under the UN Charter. So what is on offer is, is essentially accepting your status as a halot, accepting your status as, a, as, a, as subordinate to Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the Israeli the, to Israel, um, and I, I think that I think that all of these beautiful PR phrases mm -hmm. that the Israelis use have to be de de uh, deconstructed. Mm -hmm. I mean, what generous offer was Barak making? Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, as the capital of a Palestinian state, uh, should be a natural, obvious uh, uh, part of a deal. Israel's not willing to accept that, neither Ehud Barak. And I mean, we're talking about the Israeli leaders, uh, Rabin Barak and later uh, Ehud Omer, who were the most forthcoming. None of them, none of them uh, put on the table or accepted some of the basics for independence, sovereignty, and self-determination for the Palestinians. So what are the Palestinians being rejectionist about? Mm -hmm. they're, being, they're rejecting their subordination to second-class status. They're rejecting continuation of occupation. If you say we're going to maintain security control, it means you're still under occupation. Right. You, you, we'll control your population registry. We'll control your entry and exit. We'll control your imports and exports. We'll control your mar currency, which is the current situation, uh, in, into it, unto eternity. And that's basically what's more or less what's been on offer. Now, this issue of security, if you hold a people down, they will, with your boot heel, they will bite your ankle. Now, removing the boot heel is not gonna to lead to love and understanding and peace. There has to be a process to get away from occupation, to get away from colonization. You have to decolonize. And that requires changes among Israelis, of which there's no sign whatsoever, right. except among a minority of Israelis. Um, and, and that's where you're gonna finally get security. Not by saying, we will hold you down until you say uncle and do exactly as we please, which is what Israel basically says. Their insecurity is created by their security, mm -hmm. or their, their, their drive for ultimate security, which means holding the Palestinians under this awful 56-year military occupation, right. or keeping Palestinians whose ancestors left from mm -hmm. ever returning to their homeland. Right, and it's interesting you bring that up because I, I think uh, a lot of times when there is obviously more conflict and violence and things, you, you start hearing people talk of, well, what, what, what should we do? Uh, or they talk about how impossible it would be for a two-state solution in these moments and things like that, when it's almost, it's almost, like, it's almost counterproductive to even mention something like a two-state solution in moments like this, because it is difficult mm -hmm. to do, but that doesn't mean that other steps couldn't be taken towards decolonization to eventually get to a point where you can discuss longer-term solutions right. like that, when right, when right now the longer-term solutions aren't what's on the table anyway. 
Uh, and I mean, the decolonization is in things like, you know, stopping a bombing, stopping the different things, and then getting to another point. But it's almost like a red herring in a way sometimes yeah. in moments like this. I mean, as I, as I try and say in the book, the important thing, in my view, is not what form the final resolution of right. this takes, whether one state or two states or uh, binational state or, or cantons or confederation. It, I, to my way of thinking, that's not the important thing. Mm -hmm. The important thing is the establishment of a principle of absolute equality, that everybody has the same rights. Now, there's an Israeli people. Many Palestinians don't recognize that, by the way. Right. There's a Palestinian people. It's not just that Israelis don't recognize it. Israeli law, Israeli constitution says there's no Palestinian people. So, excuse me, the Palestinians have actually recognized Israel. The PLO recognized Israel. That's done. Uh, do many Palestinians not recognize it? Maybe. But leave aside whatever Israelis think. Their Knesset has, in 2018, passed into law a what is a, a law with constitutional force, mm -hmm. which basically says the Palestinians don't exist and have no rights in this country. This is the basic They're here law on some of Jewish basic nation. law of the, exactly basic yeah. law. Israel is a nation state of the Jewish, Jewish people. Jewish people, sorry. Twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. um, you got to dismantle those kinds of mm -hmm. things before you can even talk about anything. Right. Talk about one state, two states. It doesn't matter right. what you talk about. You have to have equality. Mm -hmm. You have to have mutual recognition. Right. And uh, I am. I would be the first one to admit that 75 years of dispossession and 56 years of military occupation, of ethnic cleansing, of massacres, uh, the slaughter that's going on in Gaza has probably led Palestinians to be unfavorable towards sure. Israel. I'm the first one to admit that. And I would also accept that Israelis have a negative view of Palestinians because a lot of Israelis have been killed. Mm -hmm. Many, 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 many fewer mm -hmm. than Palestinians, mm -hmm. but many Israelis. I mean, the Israeli death toll on the 8th, 9th, and 10th of October was the largest Israeli civilian death toll since 1948. It, it was, it was, it was, it was a, a, a traumatic shock mm -hmm. to Israel. Um, so I, I'd be the first one to accept not only that Palestinians have reasons to have grievances, but that also Israelis do. But these structural things, mm -hmm. like the nation state law, like the rank discrimination against Palestinian citizens of Israel since the state was create, created, mm -hmm. the dozens of laws that discriminate against Palestinians inside Israel, Palestinian citizens of the state, the way the municipalities are treated, mm -hmm. the way in which people have access to jobs, all kinds of yeah. things, land, yeah. uh, and so on. They have voting rights, yes, of course, but they don't have equal rights. Mm -hmm. All of these structural things have to be looked at before you can even talk about a settlement. Mm -hmm. And any lasting resolution has to be based on these principles of equality. Nobody seems to want to address those things, mm -hmm. nor Israelis, nor all of Israel's powerful supporters in the Western countries. And on that point, you, you talk, we talked about this kind of earlier, but uh, you mentioned the, the circumstances under, under which Israel was, uh, was created and the trauma mm -hmm. that came from you know, the Holocaust is one of the, one of the big drivers of the early right. booms in immigration. What if you, you believe that that has an effect? For example, Gabor Mate has been talking a lot recently on this trauma of the actual, you know, generational trauma, collective trauma right. of uh, people and how they respond to things like, you know, uh, the, the conflicts with the Palestinians. Do you, you think that that is also a part of policy and different reactions over the past few generations in Israel versus uh, against I mean, the th there's no question mm -hmm. um, that historical trauma mm -hmm. um, of the Jewish people uh, going back even before the Holocaust. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and the way it's embedded in Jewish religious tradition, I mean, the destruction of the temple, things like that, are still revisited annually in Jewish religious ritual. Mm -hmm. So these are things that, that are embedded trauma, mm -hmm. if you want. Um, I mean, the most, obviously, the most salient is the Holocaust, but there's a lot of other sure, things. Sure. I mean, mm -hmm. and people talking about this obsessively in Israel um, the, mo the, most, the largest number of, of Jews killed since the Holocaust. Um, uh, Kishniev pogrom is, is evoked again and again mm -hmm. and again. The 1905 pogrom in, in which dozens and dozens of innocent Jewish residents of Kishniev were murdered and people were raped and homes were looted and burned and so on. Uh, clearly those traumas, historical traumas, almost all of which have to do with Christian Europe's treatment of the Jews mm -hmm. over millennia not even centuries, millennia. You know, the Jews are expelled from England 
The Jews are expelled from France. The Jews are expelled from Spain. The Jews are expelled from Portugal. We're talking over hundreds of years in the mm -hmm. medieval period. Um, these are traumatic mm -hmm. events that you know, anybody with any sense of Jewish heritage um, is alive to. And the, 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 the culmination, obviously, is the Holocaust. So to, to deny that these are important mm -hmm. um, drivers of the way in which the first Zionist settlers and right up to the present Israeli population see things would be foolish. Obviously, these right. things are there. It should be noted, most of this is the result of the treatment of Jews by Christian Europe. Were there difficult relations between Jews and Muslims? Yes, oh, throughout history. Not much in Palestine. In fact, n almost none in Palestine. But yes, but nothing like Christian Europe. I mean, where were Jews expelled from entire countries right. in the Arab world? Before 1948, before Zionism, before the establishment of a Jewish state at the expense of Arabs. Mm -hmm. That created all kinds of backlash and horrible results for Jewish communities in the Arab world. But before Zionism, you, you don't have the same kind of Jew hatred which is the core of anti-Semitism, that is a feature of Christian doctrine up until the Second Vatican Council. The Jews, as a people, are responsible for the killing of Jesus. That's mm -hmm. the doctrine of the Catholic Church until Vatican II, we're talking about in the 60s. Um, there's nothing like that. Is there anti-Semitism in the Muslim world? Of course there is. Was there? Is there? Yes. Has it been accentuated by the conflict? Of course it has. But what most of the trauma that we're talking about is a result of the persecution of Jews in Europe, up to and including the Holocaust. Um, and that's unfortunately been transferred or into mm -hmm. uh, uh, motivation uh, for Israelis, seeing the Palestinians as only the latest tormentors of the Jewish people. With the Palestinians, if the, if the, if the settlers had been Danes, Danes, people from Denmark, had come with a national and a settler colonial project, and had tried to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians, the Palestinians would have resisted. And they would have, their, their opposition to the Danes would not have been anti-Christian. Right. It would have been against occupation and, and settlement and colonization. Mm -hmm. And that's what's driving the Palestinians. But it is coded, it is read by Israelis as these are the latest in a long line of people who just hate us because we're Jews. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem is what you're doing to the indigenous population. Right. The problem is you're substituting yourself for a people that was already there. The problem is how you treat that people. That's the problem. Right. And the, the, the ability of a construct of reality to elide, ignore, obliterate those basic core facts, mm -hmm. the real drivers of this struggle, mm -hmm. is, a, is a work of public relations genius. Mm -hmm. You know, every one of these little gems of Abba Iban and uh, Golda Meir, the Arabs never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity, are, are a PR genius, I have to mm -hmm. say it, because they manage to completely obscure what's actually going on on the ground, which is a people being replaced by another people. Um, as uh, Jabotinsky said, the transformation of Palestine into the land of Israel. That is what was intended, and that is what has happened, mm -hmm. or what is meant to happen. And so I, I think that I, I think that this is this is uh, beginning to be chipped away. Mm -hmm. I think we're beginning to see a turning in the way in which people see Israel, Israel's behavior, the absolute mendacity of its spokespeople. I mean, everybody can see that they're lying, liars, lying. Right. It's just it's it's hard not to see that. Now, unless you're a dyed-in-the-wool supporter of Israel who won't, doesn't believe anything anybody else says and will believe whatever the Israeli spokespersons and politicians say is gospel truth. In other words, if you have a brain in your head right. and you're looking at social media and you're watching what's happening and you're listening to what they say is happening, you can tell there's a disconnect. Right. This is not true. This is what's happening. Right. And that's what's beginning to happen. Right. And then the only thing you'll hear in, in, the other, in response is you know, pointing fingers at, let's say, Hamas or political groups which kind of miss the bigger picture. Not to say, obviously, what Hamas did was terrible and what's, what's happened was, was, was terrible, but it misses the bigger picture of everything we've talked about right. that doesn't have to do with the culprits of a horrible I mean, atrocity. Again, where happen. does Hamas come from? Right. What is Hamas a response to? Mm -hmm. It's a response to many things, but it has a history. It goes right. back to 1987. If you don't understand its history, if you don't understand where this rejectionism comes from, if you don't understand the, not just the religious, but mainly the political drivers right. behind it, and how what Israel has done has, in fact, reinforced right. the rejectionist and the militant elements in Palestinian politics. You understand nothing. Right. 
um, the, the Israeli body politic is perfectly aware of the fact that the Netanyahu government and some other Israeli governments over the last few years have in effect encouraged the divisions in Palestinian politics and in effect reinforced Hamas's control over the Gaza Strip as a means of avoiding a unified Palestinian national movement that could demand a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. uh, Netanyahu has said that explicitly again and again and again, so it's not like a secret. And Israelis have gotten to the fact that that helped to create the situation that produced October 7th. Mm -hmm. If you're allowing the Qataris to bring in suitcases of cash mm -hmm. to support the Hamas regime with your knowledge and understanding and agreement, then clearly uh, you have <laughs> a false understanding of what Hamas is. Right. Um, and if you don't understand that there's this whole set of Palestinian grievances, the, the population of the Gaza Strip are not the original natives of the city of Gaza or the city of Khan Yunus or the city of Rafah. 75, 80% of them are people driven into that area by Israel in 1948 as part of the ethnic cleansing of the southern parts of what is now Israel. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the core of the problem. It's not Hamas or not Hamas. That's a result of the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that Hamas is right or wrong, and that's not the issue. You've got to understand where they come from. Right. You've got to understand that this, this tendency, this militant tendency, was in fact encouraged at different phases by your government. I mean, the stories about the establishment of Hamas in the late 1980s are by Israelis, not just by Palestinians, whereby it was clear that Israeli intelligence was happy to see a rival to the PLO. Mm -hmm. The PLO was seen as the main enemy of Israel, and anything that weakened the, the PLO or the divided Palestinian ranks, mm -hmm. same policy that Netanyahu has followed more recently, mm -hmm. was seen as a good thing. And so you had carloads, busloads of thugs, of, of the Jama'a Islami, the Islamic grouping, which later became Hamas, trucked, bust across Israel to beat up PLO supporters in the West Bank universities in the 80s and in the late 70s. Um, you, had a, you had a support of the Islamic tendency in Gaza as a means of weakening the Palestinians, dividing the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And that continued even after Hamas is founded in 1987. Well, let's keep them divided. Eventually, Israelis, Israeli intelligence folks came to realize, I mean, this may not be such a good idea. Mm -hmm. But at the outset, there's a huge amount of evidence right. by Israelis. I mean, uh, I know a couple of books by Israeli analysts who talk about this in detail. Um, and so I, I don't think you can ignore all of that. I don't think you can ignore the fact that um, by weakening the PLO, by never negotiating, in my view, in good faith with the PLO, by never implementing even the miserable, faulty agreements that were made with the PLO, Israel, in effect, encouraged rejections, mm -hmm. encouraged militancy. And I think that's an important point, that the violence that's happening is the symptom of a bigger issue, which exactly. is a political issue. Exactly. And so a solution isn't going to be a violent solution, it's going to be a political solution. Um, if there is to be one, you exactly. to solve the political issue. Exactly. To, I mean, the, the, I, just to speak to this, sure. I, I think there's a belief, certainly among Israelis, that force and only force is the resolution, is the solution to this. Mm -hmm. there, there's such a belief exists among some Palestinians mm -hmm. too, by the way. Um, I think that's a delusion and a snare uh, and, a, and, and, a, and a dangerous falsehood. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the overwhelming weight of force is on the Israeli side. But what Hamas showed is that it has an amazing resilience and uh, her, uh, capability, sometimes exercised in horrific ways, and that you know, force is not going to be sufficient, mm -hmm. um, no matter how overwhelming, overwhelmingly superior Israel is. And force is not going to be sufficient no matter how many allies Hamas may think it has. Um, so I, I mean, I argue in the book um, uh, for different aspects of what should be Palestinian strategy. Um, and I, I, I don't really think that, uh, in particular, Israel has understood what you just said, that sooner or later you have to have some kind of political vision that accepts that there are two peoples in this country. How that is worked out, I don't know. We're not very close to it, so in a sense it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to accept that the Palestinians have peoplehood and have exactly the same national rights as any other people, and that all whole kinds of things follow from that. You can't say, because of our security, we have to make you insecure. No. You can't say, because of our, our um, natural, inherent, God-given, whatever, rights, mm -hmm. we will infringe on your rights, and we will have this, and you can't have that. 
when you say equality, it has to be equality of political rights, national rights, it has to be equality of civil rights and political rights, it has to be equality of religious rights. Mm -hmm. You can't say, we will take over uh, this mosque mm -hmm. because it once belonged to us or because it has the, you can't do those things. Mm -hmm. There has to be a certain respect, mm -hmm. um, both of Jewish and Christian and Muslim mm -hmm. religious rights, uh, which is simply not the case today. Right. Uh, and that's just one of a whole litany yeah. of ways in which rights are being infringed. And that's, you have to change all of that. Yeah, and it's, uh, there's actually, I'm sure you're familiar with Mahmoud Mamdani's work uh -huh. on, and, and his, him talking about separating the nation from the state right. in a way. And, and I think he, he uses the comparison to South Africa right. and how the only, re, the only way they got any success was because everyone came to the table and they separated this idea of the white nation being the right. driver and the owner of the state right. and allowing other people in. Um, yeah, but it, uh, I guess that, uh, that's a whole other thing, I guess, getting to. Well, yeah. I, I think South Africa and actually Ireland, Ireland yeah. are two cases of settler colonialism mm -hmm. where we may see some basis mm -hmm. for moving towards a resolution, uh, which is a Pacific one, which is a, a one involving acceptance. Um, I don't know that we're there in either right. case. Right. In fact, I don't think we're there in either case. And there's a hard row to hoe yeah. ahead of them, the Irish and the, and the South Africans. But, and they, they entail, every settler colonial project is different. Zionism is completely different than every other one. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Palestine, it's different for multiple reasons. I mean, Ireland's a very important place and South Africa's a very important place, but it's not the center of devotion for three global right. monotheisms. Right. Um, it's not, they're neither of them is, they're both st extremely strategically important, but they're not as strategically important as Palestine, mm -hmm. historically. Um, so it's harder, it's a harder case, Palestine and Israel, obviously. But I think that looking at those kinds of ways in which settler colonial uh, uh, situations mm -hmm. uh, were, if not resolved, moved towards resolution might help us think, uh, you know, more creatively in mm -hmm. terms of Palestine and Israel. Okay. I guess we should wrap it up. You're busy. You're busy guy. Thank you for having us up here. I, I, I wanted to commend you on, I guess, the book and, and also it's, it's personal history, which I thought was great. Uh, I guess I think that really helped kind of uh, make it make it more um, digestible and, mm -hmm. and captivating. Uh, is there is there something that kind of drove you to? to... Yeah, well, I, uh, the, the, the main I mean, I got an enormous help from my mm -hmm. editor, from my agent uh, in, in making the book more relatable mm -hmm. and, and, and in pushing me to to, to bring in personal stuff so that people could understand how what I was talking about historically affected people. Mm -hmm. But the main person who did that was really my son, who's a playwright, and said, you know, enough already writing books for other, boring books for other historians. Write something that, you know, normal people can read. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he pushed me very, very hard. My, I have to say, my editor also, she was wonderful in pushing me in that direction. Mm -hmm. So was my agent. They, they helped to shape this, the, the form the book takes where Every chapter begins with something personal, mm -hmm. and, it, and uh, all of it, as much as I could, incorporates you know family material, material that that is about people, uh, rather than you know dry diplomatic sure. or strategic uh, you know history. Oh, well, that's nice. Your son, your son giving you guff has helped, yeah. oh. helped, helped shape it, huh? That's yeah. a good. After my wife, he's my harshest critic. There you go. All, all you kids out there giving your parents guff, it's not for nothing, huh? It is perfect living proof here. Um, well, one more thing, I guess, just to kind of end it, or, or try to end it, I guess, on a more, on a, on a positive note, I guess, what, what gives you hope, I guess? Obviously, everything is terrible. Uh, there's, there's been tragedy on both sides in the last six months. It's been a, what in all of this has given you hope uh, with what's happening, I guess? I mean, look, it's very yeah. hard to be hopeful. Sure towards the end of a six month of this atrocious war on Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, more Palestinians have been killed in this war. The number is close to 33,000 dead and seven or 8,000 missing, undoubtedly dead. We're talking 40,000 people killed, mm -hmm. 60, 70,000 people wounded. It's the worst atrocity in Palestinian history, it, uh, matching the level of 1948. Um, two million people almost have been displaced. 750,000 were displaced in 1947, 48, 49. So it's really hard to talk about something hopeful. Mm -hmm. If I see anything hopeful in this, it's that I think people the world over, especially younger people, are for the first time be, being forced to look in real time 
at atrocities taking place and are able to come to their own conclusions mm -hmm. about this war and are able to get past the media and political censorship that has essentially created a barrier of lies and disinformation mm -hmm. around Palestine. Um, and you see this all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, not just talking about demonstrations. I'm talking about the, 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 the percentages of people who vote uncommitted or non-committed or mm -hmm. whatever in primary elections. I'm talking about dozens and dozens of American politicians saying things that no American politician has ever said before. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about governments all over the world beginning to change their policies. To my way of thinking, that's a, a reason for hope. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't bring back the 30 odd thousand, 40,000 Palestinians who are dead, and the thousands of others who are starving to death and may die. Probably many of them will die, the way things are going. It won't bring them back to life. Uh, it may not change the situation on the ground or the political horizon for Palestinians for a little while. But sooner or later, those factors have to come into, into, into play. From the beginning, this war was one involving the world, involving the great powers. If they are affected, this war will be affected. If they begin to change their approach, then there are possibilities for change among Palestinians and Israelis. If they don't, we will continue to see this war waged on Palestine with m many Israelis killed, but many, 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 many more Palestinians killed. Mm -hmm. And enmity, anger, and regional instability caused, as has been happening since the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Regional instability has been created by this war. Mm -hmm. And it has, we can see it today. Yeah. Yemen, right. uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Iraq. Uh, each of them have their own issues, but they are be, they're being drawn into a larger, Iran, mm -hmm. being drawn into a larger conflict. Um, I, I'm not hopeful that things will change quickly, but I think that these transformations, especially among young people, mm -hmm. sooner or later are gonna have to have an effect. And that gives me a long range reason for hope. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, I think one of the things that I've noticed is people are, are the atrocities are taking place, it's been really horrible and hard to watch, but people are being forced to have conversations are being forced to go around the, the, the conventional media narrative and, and do the research and have the conversation with people, listen, look right. for more voices. And I think that, to me at least, gives me some hope uh, you know, through it all. And even this right here. This is, I mean, even this and putting this, these kinds of voices out and having these kinds of conversations more often in public as well. Uh, so that's, that's what gives me hope, but it is hard. And I, I've taken so much of your time, I already feel bad. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Would you mind signing my book? Not at all. This would be, this is a big, uh, this is a huge, you know, I'm getting kind of starstruck here. So you got to uh, uh, sign the front of my book and, and uh, this, is, uh, this is, you know. Jean-Pierre? Meeting Elvis here. Oh, I wrote down to different people I wanted to oh, look I up see, that you I mentioned. See. I see, sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah. Two? It's a good old Tom, I guess. That's just, that's me. So I'm just, that'd be good. Yeah, pretty cool. But uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Professor uh, Khalidi. This was this was really helpful, and uh, you know I hope I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, you know I got my signed book, and I'll be on my way and let you, you get go. your work done. Thank you very much. You're I'll very take welcome. that pen, and thank you. Thanks again. Not at all. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. I really appreciate it. All right.